Hey guys, in this video I want to provide some guidance on buying lower end motherboards for the Intel platform. I'd like to give you a quick shout out to Asus for sending over this huge selection of the B760 boards to go over. And by the way, we did a similar video for the high end Z790 boards already. If you're interested, the link is in the description below. First, I want to do a quick refresher on the chipset classes that Intel provides. The Intel Z790, H770 and B760 chipsets are all designed to be used on the latest two generations of Intel processors, but they do offer slightly different features and capabilities. Here is a brief overview of how they compare. Z790 is a high-end chipset that is more suitable for the use with the Intel K-series processors, which are designed for overclocking. The Z790 supports the most PCIe lanes with some limitations, high-speed memory, and range of connectivity options, including USB 4. It is well suited for gaming and other demanding applications. H770 is a mid-range chipset that is designed for use with non-overclocking Intel processors. It can still support reasonable PCIe expansion, high-speed memory, and range of connectivity options. It is a good choice for users who need good performance but don't need the extreme capabilities of Z790. B760 is an entry-level chipset that is designed for use with non-overclocking Intel processors. It supports limited PCIe expansion and memory capabilities, and also has limited connectivity options. It is a good choice for users who need the basic motherboard for everyday computing tasks. Overall, the Z790 is the most feature-rich and powerful of the three chipsets, followed by the H770 and B760. The right chipset for you will depend on your specific needs and budget. I feel this video is perfect for those who are looking to save some money on their motherboard and don't require overclocking features where b 760 chipsets slots in the best. So without further ado, let's dive into the options available and what you should be looking out for. When picking up a board, there are a few places you can start. If you're going down the price to performance side, then you might as well just look at the lower zone board straight away. But I see many people start the build based on the case they've been eyeing out. There are three most common motherboard sizes that are being used. A full-size board with loads of potential PCIe and drive expansions, which are often referred to as an ATX. Then there is a motherboard known as Micro ATX. It is a slightly smaller in size, or more accurately, slightly shorter. It is essentially an ATX motherboard without the bottom 25%. As a result, there's typically less room for PC expansion and NVMe drives. And lastly, my favorite is the Mini ITX board, which is the smallest of the motherboard sizes. It has the fewest expansion options and only has a single PCIe slot, which usually is occupied by the graphics card and limited amount of slots for NVMe storage. To increase the number of storage and I.O. options, some manufacturers have started building Mini ITX boards with additional layers on the Z axis, but that also means that these boards become very expensive. If the size of the case is not a concern, you can focus on the features of the motherboard starting with the RAM support. Both Intel 12th and 13th gen chips support both DDR4 and DDR5 memory, so you have a choice between the two when selecting motherboards. Asus motherboards have D4 in the name to indicate support for DDR4 memory. It is important to note that you cannot mix and match these types of memory. If you're upgrading an existing system and you already have some DDR4 memory, it might be more cost effective to stick with DDR4 and save the money. On the other hand, DDR5 prices have been decreasing and its performance has improved. So if you're building a new system from scratch, you may want to consider looking for DDR5 memory deals instead. Next consideration is memory capacity, and that starts with memory slots. Mini ITX and some of the cheaper boards come with only two slots, and to most that'll be enough. I personally have not used more than two sticks of memory for over a decade. But if you need more memory capacity or want to do a gradual upgrade, for example, start with two sticks of 8GB totaling 16GB of memory, which is a very reasonable amount nowadays. And in the future, rather than selling these and buying larger capacity, you could simply buy two more and bring up to a total of 32GB. Another factor to consider is PCIe expansion options, including generation of PCIe slots. Many boards from the Strix and Tough series have the top slot that communicates with the CPU via PCIe Gen 5x16. Tough Gaming, B760 ME D4, and lower end Prime boards use Gen 4 connection. Currently, there are no PCIe Gen 5 graphics cards on the market, so this may not be a significant factor to consider at the moment. However, it may be worth considering in the next two to three years. Then we have additional expansion slots. These are no longer connecting directly to the CPU, rather going through the B760 chipset. In ATX size boards, you may have the larger Time16 slot connections. But in the case of the boards we have here, they are all electronic and connected only via four lanes, so bandwidth is limited. Don't expect to plug in high-end graphics cards there and have it perform at full speed. 
Another thing to note is that some of the boards like Strix G, Creator and some of the Tough Gaming have their lanes running at PC Gen 4, while others have it running at PC Gen 3. This can be important for those who want to populate the slot with super high speed devices. On some of the boards there will also be much shorter times 1 slots, either PC Gen 3 or Gen 4. For example, all Strix boards feature two of them and they are very useful for things like sound cards, wireless or wired network cards, adding extra USB ports or even installing a lower end SATA or NVMe drive. Do note, with PC Gen 3 you are limited to 1GB speed and with PC Gen 4 it will be 2GB. Also, if you enjoy the video, please consider subscribing for more tech videos like this. The next pretty important item is storage support. And from our motherboard reviews, we normally see a lot of confusion here. Currently, Intel platform supports only 20 PC lanes, which means you can connect a typical graphics card that takes up 16 of them and then single NVMe drive, and both of these items will communicate with the CPU directly at full speed. This leaves any other devices communicating via chipsets, which has its own limitations. With this out of the way, let's see what options are available. On the high-end boards, we tend to see more drive support, up to 3 in most cases. But be careful as some have limitations. For example, ProArt B760 Creator D4 has its third NVMe drive running at PC Gen 3 speeds, while Prime B760 Plus has its third drive running only with two lanes, which to be fair is equivalent to four lanes, of PC Gen 3. By the way, those who are not familiar with what the numbers stand in the M.2 slots, the first number of a name refers to the width of the drive, which is typically 22 or 42 mil. The second number refers to the length of the drive, which can vary between 30 and 110 mil. SATA wise, ASUS has made it very easy on these boards. You can connect up to four drives on either one of them. There are also several options available for networking. It is convenient that we have access to both fast wired and wireless connections. When planning out your networking setup, consider whether you'll use Wi-Fi and make sure to choose the board that includes it. It is advisable to have Wi-Fi capability as it is useful for troubleshooting and offers more flexibility. Most boards have Wi-Fi 6E built in, with some just with Wi-Fi 6 and for example B760 Creator has neither and needs a separate Wi-Fi module to be purchased. As far as wired networks are concerned, these boards mostly come with 2.5 gigabit connection. High-end boards have used Intel chip and lower-end ones use the chip from Realtek. Do note that Creator motherboard has two network ports, one 2.5 gigabit like the others and the other one is 1 gigabit. This allows you to use the faster port connecting directly to your storage server and the slower port for general networking, maximizing the speed for local data transfer then without the need of expensive networking equipment. There is also some confusion surrounding USB connectivity due to various standards. For simplicity, I'll refer to them by connection type, type A and type C, and speed, 5, 10 and 20 gigabit. These speeds are generally referred to as USB 3.2 Gen 1, which is 5 gigabit, Gen 2, which is 10 gigabit, and Gen 2x2, which is 20 gigabit. Keep in mind that there is also an older and slower standard called USB 2, which should only be used for less important peripherals if you're running low on ports. The other distinction is where they're located, if they're at the back or if it's a front header connection. Ports at the back can be immediately used, while ports at the front header require a case with compatible connection. Most of the high-end boards have the fastest 20 gigabit Type-C port and it is located at the back of the motherboard. On the other hand, Tough Gaming B760M Plus Wi-Fi has it as an internal header for the front connector. The low-end Prime board only has 5 gigabit Type-C for the front header. As far as Type-A ports are concerned, I feel all of these boards have plenty in most cases. Have a look at a few of these boards and take note that most of the ports in red and green are 10 gigabit and ports in blue are normally 5 gigabit. On some of these boards you can see the speed written right by the USB sign. I wish they had this on all the boards out there. While we're at the back, the other thing to note is audio connections, and more importantly what DAC and AMP these boards use. If you care about audio at all, you may want something with high-end components, but generally speaking, you're probably better off getting a separate USB version for best performance and flexibility. There are two more features that are important to note, the quantity of fan headers as well as RGB headers and what type they are. Let's start with the fan headers. Nowadays you probably need at least three, unless you build an extravagant PC with a ridiculous amount of fans. Many multi-fan packs come with a fan controller, and same goes with many cases, but you should still check what you need. When building out an ITX case, I usually prefer using a separate fan controller to make it the cable management a lot easier. There are also two types of RGB headers to consider, the older 4-pin connector and the newer 3-pin ARGB connector. The main difference between RGB and ARGB headers is the way they control lighting of connected devices. 
RGB headers use simple on-off control method, which allows the user to choose specific color for lighting, but does not allow for more advanced lighting effects. ARGB headers, on the other hand, use a more advanced control method that allows for greater range of lighting effects. With ARGB headers, each LED can be individually controlled, allowing a more complex and dynamic lighting effects. I recommend doing a rough plan for this ahead of purchasing. Next, I want to do a quick fire round, highlighting differences between each price point, which may not directly impact performance, but are more of a quality of life features. M.2 heatsinks. Not all boards have them for the additional drives. M.2 mounting. High-end boards from ASUS include drive latch, while cheaper boards require to screw the drive in. This can be more inconvenient in the busy case. Q-release. This is a button that releases the top PCIe slot which is very useful when removing large graphics card for troubleshooting, servicing, or upgrading. Pre-installed IO shield. Some cheaper boards don't come with this, which can be inconvenient if you forget to install it in the first place. Other factors to consider when purchasing a motherboard include the looks and price. The B760 series is cheaper than the H770 and Z790, but not as cheap as the last gen B660, which is still compatible with both 12th and 13th gen Intel CPUs. You may also want to consider high-end large-gen boards or second-hand market to save some money. Please let us know in the comments below what features are important to you when purchasing a motherboard. Are you someone who just wants to get a bare-bones product that just works or you need specific features? Also note that the pricing may have changed since the video was published, so please check the links below for the up-to-date pricing. I hope you found this useful. Don't forget to smash that thumbs up and subscribe for more. We'll see you guys in the next one.